Um, we would like to invite public comment at this time. Please make sure if you're going to come up and talk uh, at the podium that you've signed in at the back of the room um, or at the podium with your name and address before you come forward to speak. Public comment is limited to three minutes, which will count down on the timer on the wall that's up there in red. If your comment pertains to an action item that appears on the agenda, we would ask that you wait um, until that item comes up for discussion to make your comment. You will be allowed time to comment after the board discusses the item and before the board votes on it. Comments related to disciplinary actions or other matters, which could be for the subject of a grievance process, or comments that are derogatory of any person, business, or organization will be ruled out of order. If you would like to make a public comment at this time, please step forward <coughs> and state your name and address. <coughs> Hello, good evening. Um, hello, CPS administrators, members of the board. My name is Christina Ingolia. My four-year-old daughter, Lily, currently attends the Early Childhood Special Education Program at the Early Childhood Learning Center. Lily has made significant progress with her teacher, Ms. Rochelle Burke, who deserves all the accolades you and I may bestow upon her. I always preach the good word of Ms. Rochelle. Um, having said that, <laughs> I'm here tonight along with many other parents, as you can see, to request that you change the recording policy for IEP and 504 meetings. I'm not here as someone embattled. Um, in fact, Lily's IEPs thus far have gone really well. Um, my team, led by Ms. Burke, considers the feedback my husband and I give. Um, however, I would still like to be able to record all meetings. Even when IEPs go well, they are emotional. For example, the first one, when Lily was transitioning into the program at age three, felt like a tidal wave had hit us. My husband and I showed up prepared to take notes, listen, respond. When the school psychologist read off Lily's first evaluation results, I teared up and lost focus. My husband and I discussed later that he felt the same way. If you've never had results like this read to you, I can tell you it's difficult to hear. <laughs> um, nothing happened that went badly. This is, for better or worse, a day in the life of a parent to a child with disabilities. But I looked back at those notes a year later and more recently for tonight, and I can tell you they are nonsensical and scant. Um, for our second IEP, a friend and SEPTA rep accompanied us just to take notes, and that went better. Um, even then, though, with a designated note keeper, there are a few notes that have me scratching my head. If the meeting had been recorded, I'd be able to consult the record and figure it out. I'm not suggesting that my head scratches are even over something controversial. The truth is I have no idea what those notes refer to which worries me. What might I be missing that could help or harm my daughter? Recording would also take pressure off our wonderful teachers and specialists who cannot write everything down that happens in the meeting either. We, can, we want them to feel good about the conversation. We want to help them and us remember what was agreed to. I see this as a proactive way to main, maintain respectful and collaborative relationships. We want to make sure the school has a clear record of what transpired and that all parties can access the recording when needed in order to benefit our children whose meetings they are. They're not our meetings, they're our children's meetings, right? Ultimately, ultimately if this can help all IEP team members avoid disputes about what was discussed versus what was written down, we must do everything in our power to do that, to sustain a united and productive working relationship. I thank you and we all thank you. Hi, my name is Emery Wakefield. I'm a junior at Rockbridge High School. I enjoy my classes there, especially AP Art and Digital Media Studio over at the Career Center. I'm active in the GSA Club and I'm on the SLAM Poetry team. I also happen to have a diagnosis of anxiety disorder which can disable me from accessing school and learning information. Because of this, I have a 504 plan that provides accommodations for me to learn. This plan is developed during a 504 meeting where my counselors, nurses, teachers, administrators, myself, and my parents sit around a table to create a plan that will work for me. I'm here to request that the board consider changing the recording policy, KKB, so that it will allow students, parents, and teachers to record 504 and IEP meetings. 
These meetings can trigger my anxiety and make it difficult for me to process what is being said in the moment. It would be helpful for me to go back and listen to what was discussed. It's hard to take notes and comprehend everything. Sometimes the written plan does not appear to reflect what I recall from the meeting. I would like to go back and listen to what was discussed. Another problem is that these meetings occur during the school day, and I have to leave in the middle of my 504 meeting to go to class. This causes me to miss what was discussed, which is a real problem since it's my plan. Policy KKB mentions that recording would be a violation of FERPA. That makes no sense for prohibiting parents to record meetings. FERPA restricts school staff from sharing a student's personal information, but parents are allowed to access and share their child's information. Finally, I'm concerned that policy KKB allows the superintendent or his designee to secretly record IEP and 504 meetings without any of the participants' knowledge. This type of secret recording would appear to be against the one-party consent law of the state, and this needs to be examined closely. Thank you for your time and consideration to allow parents, teachers, and students to record 504 and IEP meetings. Hi, thank you. My name is Michelle Roboto. I'm currently the president of the Columbia Special Education PTA, also known as SEPTA. Um, we're a group that's constantly growing. We've already steadily increased 150% of our mem membership from August to May, and 20% of our members are educators. And I sincerely want to thank you for reviewing this recording policy and taking into consideration all of our views about that. Um, and as you know, SEPTA has um, voted on a policy We really support the policy change, and we've voted and put it out a um, policy a position statement. I have a little packet I'm going to give the board secretary before I leave, and there's a copy for each of you in there with some information along with our position statement. Um, I, I have uh, three children at Columbia Public Schools. One is on an IEP, one is on a 504. I'm just going to tell you very quickly my story about why I think that um, the recording would have helped in my situation. Um, simply having a recording of my daughter's 504 meeting would have saved a very long and expensive process for me. Um, I received a document after our 504 meeting, and it did not include a very large chunk of items that were in my notes, and they were not in the document. When I questioned this, I was returned with an email that said those items were not discussed in the meeting, but they were in my notes. Um, so instead of at that point, we could have listened to a recording, but unfortunately, we didn't have one. So instead, it took four additional meetings for us to get my daughter's 504 put into place. Um, it was three meetings that I had to hire the therapist to come back and talk. It was two meetings that I had to pay an advocate, in addition to having the advocate help me prepare outside. On the school side, the time of the <coughs> members of the 504 team to attend two additional meetings having a sub cover the class, I had a conference call with special services, and an additional meeting with a super, an assistant superintendent. That is a lot of time and effort and money on CPS's part for this 504 that if I had simply had a recording, could have had all of those issues stopped. Well, in the end, all the things that were omitted from the paperwork that I originally pointed out were indeed added in, and the cost did not change the outcome, it just made it less efficient. So basically, I'm short on time, so I'm just going to quickly say um, the one thing I did want to point out is one of the things that I've been hearing is that the district must protect the confidentiality of minors in these meetings. However, I do feel that this is a misleading statement. Uh, the parents and guardians of the child are in attendance at these meetings, so I am having a difficult time figuring out where this confidentiality um, concern lies. Um, there are no other children that are allowed to be discussed, and in addition, um, the parents that have disabilities, some of those parents may not want it to be known that they have a disability, and that will appear in their child's record um, if, it, if they request for the recording. Um, and, whoa, <laughs> wow, <It is> <laughs> that was loud. I guess I should have paid more attention. <laughs> so, okay, I will stop. <laughs> Any further public comment? Yes. <laughs> My name is Amy Saladay. I'm an attorney and owner of Columbia Family Law Group. I have two children who receive special education services in the Columbia Public School District. I'm also a member of Como SEPTA. 
First of all, I want to thank many of you. Many of you have taken time out to talk to all of us on the phone, in person. We bombarded Jonathan with coffee. <laughs> Um, I have no problem so being bombarded with coffee. We appreciate that, and we just want you to know that we, we know that we're being heard and that you're listening to us. We also want you to know that this, this policy is not an attack on the teachers. We love our teachers. Myself, I don't think my kids could get to the day without having their learning specialist, so I'm so thankful for all of those that we work with. <clears throat> to me, this recording policy is simple. It benefits everyone. It benefits parents. It benefits teachers. It benefits students. This policy or some form of it has already been adopted in 39 other states. So we wouldn't be the first, we probably won't be the last, but it's a policy that benefits everyone. When I think about the purpose of the policy and what we're trying to achieve, the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, the purpose of that federal law is to provide further education, to help our students become employed, and to help them live independently. This policy change furthers that goal. In terms of thinking about whether to adopt the policy, as a community, we have to think about what our morals are when it comes to protecting our most vulnerable population of students. We all would agree that we want our students to have every opportunity to succeed in the classroom. This policy accomplishes that objective. Many of these special education meetings take place during the workday where one or both parents can't attend. So having a recording policy would allow both parents to be actively involved in their child's education. Parental involvement, I think, is something that we all can also agree on. With respect to the concern about whether or not teachers will talk, many of us already have strong relationships with our learning specialists, our regular education teachers, our principals, our school counselors, our reading recovery teachers. We talk to them at school events, we talk to them on the phone, we talk to them via email, we talk to them at pick up and drop off. And so the recording would only be of these special education meetings and we don't feel like that because we already have good relationships and talk to these people frequently, that recording is going to make them feel like they can't talk. Without belaboring this further, we had a radio show Thursday, November 9th on um, KOPN. We have one tomorrow night six o'clock evening edition KOPN and you can download it as a podcast so if you can't tune in download the podcast from Thursday download the podcast tomorrow and listen to it it's all about the recording policy and we'll go into great depth about it thank you Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. David Wayo. Uh, I want to just commend the SEPTA group for speaking up. Can you give your address, please? Yes. Um, I want to commend the SEPTA group for speaking up about this policy change. I think this policy change, although I'm not here speaking about this, I think it will, uh, it ties to the racial disparities that are happening here in Colombia. And this type of recording would help in the advocacy, not only of all students uh, with special education, but especially as people like World Street Roundtable, Race Matters Friends are trying to help advocate for students of color. I'm here to speak specifically though around, um, my work has to do with culturally responsive practices in schools. Uh, I research specifically racial policies and politics in education. Um, I'm not here to talk about anything that has happened recently and has come, has been brought up in the news. Um, I'm here to speak about how CPS continues to have these racial disparities in our school systems. Um, and there's multiple legal suits happening around them. Um, what's, what's interesting to me is I've come from being a um, college of ed student, student teaching here in, in CPS to a master's degree, a PhD degree. Ever since I've been here in Columbia and working in CPS as a student, um, indirectly with teachers and directly with students, there has been a racial issue in the classroom uh, where teachers are aggressive towards our students, especially our students of color. I'm here to talk about um, what is the repercussion that is happening, that, that, that teachers, um, are receiving 
because of being aggressive towards our students, especially our students of color. Um, I understand that there's, uh, thanks to the leadership of Carla London and Dr. Steepleman, um, over the years, CPS has attempted to um, create equity training and restorative practices. However, the research does state that in order to really solve these re uh, racial disparity issues, there has to be a more um, holistic approach. Uh, we need an investment in ensuring all educators in CPS are culturally responsive and that our students are protected from those teachers that, that are being aggressive our, uh, against our students, especially those students of color. And so as a scholar, <coughs> helping teachers and administrators better serve our students. I want to know three things in particular, uh, but I only have time for one. Uh, this is because school principals have approached me and they're interested in uh, supporting these practices, but they don't have enough funding to do ongoing training. We need more funding to do, do this type of training. Thank you. Thank you very much. How are you? Uh, my name is Chad McLaren. Um, I've represented um, Race Matters Friends before as well uh, in front of city council. Um, I'd like to say I'm, I'm pretty happy with like a lot of the policy influence we've been able to change and some of the organizational values and you know, some of the memorandums we've been able to push I think is, um, is heartening. Uh, my attention is now focusing on CPS. Uh, about a month ago, particularly, there was a 14-year-old girl involved in an altercation. School personnel decided at that point in time to intervene, have them arrested, held in juvenile. Subsequently, this young woman was placed on uh, whatever limited um, observation by the school psychologist attempted suicide. There was footage of this video on one of the students' phones and nobody, the teachers, the presidents, anybody who was involved in that entire process took a breath to even look at any evidence before they just traumatized this young girl. I can't tell you how upset that makes me. Um, this is actually a pretty good facade, but um, I, I'm, I'm fairly outraged over this. This has been a month. Proactively, CPS should have been behind this. There should have been some public apologies across the board. There should have been self-initiated policy changes over the way that this case was treated. And I really doubt this is the only case. This is something coming to my mind, but it is so egregious to me that it does stick out. And so I think for the next near future, my focus is gonna be stuck on what is CPS doing to fix your organizational culture? Because you're not different from CPD. We're not different from the city of Columbia or any other gatekeepers of power. Every organization and institution needs to check what their policies are, who they're focusing on, and if you have to sit there and reassert the fact that you're there to serve children and not harass them, that needs to be enforced as well. Um, I, I guess like, you know, the overriding feature behind me is like, how, how, many, how many dead kids are too many? Because that's what we're headed for. So I'd like to see some adult interaction, some adult intervention, fix these policies, fix these teachers if necessary. Good evening, my name is Robin Shelton. Um, tonight I wanna to speak directly to CPS's seclusion and restraint policy, um, which is JGGA. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of Missouri Disability Empowerment, which is a local advocacy group for those with disabilities. Um, a month ago, Representative Chuck Basie, um, which is a Boone County legislator, contacted me. He, is, he was acting as the chair of the Elementary and Secondary Education Committee. And he asked our group for its opinion on legislation regarding um, the seclusion and restraint policy. Now, I knew nothing about this policy, so I had to do some research, and I spoke to some parents who were impacted, whose kids were impacted by this policy. One thing I found very quickly is that there's a significant discrepancy between DESE's model policy and MSBA, which is the Missouri School Board Association's suggested policy, which is also the policy that CPS uses. And I will give you guys the, the excerpt from the policies that have the big difference and that the legislation pertains to. DESE's model policy has more requirements and protections for the students in place. 
MSBA's policy, which is CPS's policy, is lacking that. Um, when you look at this, you will be able to see why this policy needs to be updated without me going into any of the stories that I was told by some of the parents. The legislation, which would require stronger seclusion and restraint policy, passed unanimously in both House committees. Um, it's run out of time. If you know anything that's going on right now, you know nothing's happening right now down in Jeff's city. They're filibustering. So not, not much is going on, but this had a lot of support, bipartisan support. I want to point out that we have heard two examples tonight, well, I guess a few more, um, where MSBA policy is not looking out for the best interest of the students. And the record is, recording policy some parents mentioned, um, the policy actually differs from state law, which allows one-sided recording. In the case of seclusion and restraint policy, the current policy is weak and doesn't follow DESE's model policy. Um, I appreciate the work MSBA does, but CPS needs to make sure that the policies they adopt from MSBA meet CPS's high standards. And I would ask that CPS would do what is right for their students and update these two policies. Um, please don't wait for a legislative push to do this. Lead locally. Um, that's why you've been voted into the position you're in, to make these tough decisions and not to let our legislators do that. We don't want them dictating what happens here at CPS. Do the right thing for the students, and let's not forget that these policies are in place to protect and for our students. Thanks.